enjoyed Martha and Jack and um, <laughs> our neighbors too, who, uh, who was next door? Lees. Lees. Lee, yeah. yeah, the Lees were very close. But it was a very warm, lovely place to be growing up in. And I enjoyed the fact that I didn't have to get in a car and go to a church. I could walk across the campus and became very involved <coughs> in working on getting contemporary music in the services. And I was involved with starting and working with somebody who was a, gu a guitarist. I don't remember his name. Yeah, I don't either. You don't but, either? But it was associated with Ascension Lutheran. Yeah and started the contemporary services and that was very happy with doing that. Um, it was an easy place to raise our children because they had other people to play with and other seminary students or children of minister of the next door yes. neighbor and David had a comment is it on doing all sorts of throwing balls into a you know he and the Bornham and yeah. kids used yeah. to play softball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. which they now, this is your son? <coughs> yeah. Your David. son's name yeah. was? David. Okay. Yeah. And we, have a, we have a daughter, Beth. And Beth was her, a, a friends of uh, one of Martha's children. Uh, Mar um, Martha? Rebecca. Rebecca, Rebecca yes, yeah. excuse me. Yeah. And uh, they had quite a very good relationship. Yeah, they did. It was a, a neat place. And you felt safe with letting your kids get out in the city, you know. The whole yard and the whole seminary campus was, as far as I was concerned, a safe place for them. I was at, at the time at First Lutheran Church in downtown Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. Um, and I did know, had met Harold Elbert, who later, who was here in homiletics. I had also been in a conference with uh, Jack Ruman and knew him, and no, almost no one else, but knew him from that conference. And the position of pastoral care became vacant. I was actually at Pittsburgh, director of the counseling center and in general ministry. Uh, Harold Elbert had moved out, so I was filling that gap of senior pastor in a sense. And I think it was Harold who mentioned yeah. my name. Mm -hmm. um, and I came here for an interview. Actually was interviewed by uh, Bill Lazarus, maybe Ted Tapper. But it was the, it was the <coughs> age at which we had named people here. Jack Ruman included. Uh, so they call, extended the call, and I was most happy to accept it. And came to the seminary in '67, never left. One of the memories and illustrates what Ruth said is when we moved into the house in Boy, at in at on Boyer Street, Ken Garver, who was maintenance man of the at that time came over to welcome us to the community and was very informal and personal in terms of his interest. I, I'm not sure he knew he was representing the community, but he certainly gave us a picture of that. My earliest memory is also Martin Heineken, um, because I was teaching a course and they had, they, the institution or somebody, had Martin sit in on my classes, and I, it should have scared the bejeebas out of me, <laughs> but I later discovered that I was under the test to see how I was going to do in this environment. Martin was very, uh, very supportive, actually. He would enter at certain times when I was lectured, but I even covered in one or two lectures Soren, Soren Kierkegaard, of which Martin knew every detail, and he was still rather hospitable and not correcting me in whatever I said or didn't say. Um, so, but that was the for the seminary and for some time, 
that was, the community was a community of well-known churchmen. And it certainly was a, it was a time when identity was assumed. Theology was primary, and the theology was Lutheran theology, and it sort of set the pace where you didn't question about uh, our identity. That was sort of lived out. Even in the classroom, he could really be quite specific uh, and really quite central, uh, and he could get by with that. He was, the students loved it, uh, and he taught theology through it. It was him. And so I had met uh, Martin because I was chair in the college, uh, Wartburg College, and he was the speaker. So I knew a bit about him, but I really got acquainted. He was a character and a person unto himself who could tell rather raunchy jokes and be entertaining and not offensive. Yeah. Ted Tapper, of course, was a was a person unto himself. I knew him by reputation and his involvement in the Lutheran confessions. Um, but he was closer to other faculty, like Clarence Lee. I did get acquainted with him, but I never talked with him. Clarence. Uh, he was, he was very close to Gerhard Krodel, uh, but he was a very bright person, uh, knew what he was, but less, to me, he was less personable than some of the other people I've mentioned. But he certainly was respected in the classroom, both by, uh, well, we had mostly male students at that time. And that leads us in another direction, but uh, I had great respect for Clarence, but I wasn't that cl close to him. You mentioned Bill Lazarus. Bill, yes, knew him. He eventually taught a course with him. Uh, he was a brilliant guy. He could be very, uh, I think, he could... Well, I've seen him in the classroom, I saw him a time or two, put down a student who didn't know his theology. And he could be, Bill was very honest, the faith to him was very important, but he could be rather nasty in terms of how he reacted to mistakes or heresies or whatever you might call it. Mm. But. Uh, Bill had a gift with words and would play him and play with them and draw images from them and all kinds of things. Borderman was a neighbor, mm -hmm. uh, knew him. He was one of the, quote, younger people, faculty, had established himself as a um, r r uh, genuine professor of Old Testament. Um, I knew him because of his work with the choir, and while I didn't uh, necessarily agree with the, uh, the the music he had them perform, he was very gifted at it, mm -hmm. and they were very good. He could draw them into to present classical music, medieval music. So. Knew him mostly. I, I, when I was here for a while, I put a yard light, mercury vapor yard light, in the on the house to illuminate the backyard, which was full of bushes and dark spots. And uh, Borneman, who was of an earlier lineage, when it was safe at the on the campus, who n seldom locked his doors because he trusted everything was rather put out, was rather, <laughs> rather angry that I had wrecked the nature of the place. So it caused me to climb up the ladder again and, and where the shade was 
directed, well, where the globe allowed light to go to his house, I painted black. <laughs> then he was a little Forgot more happy. That. <laughs> and, and in communion, uh, again, he was of the old school. I thought I was being pretty nice uh, when I was uh, doing communion uh, to lift up the host, the, the, the uh, wafer and the who, he did not like that. That was not called for in his liturgy. And he let me know that you don't break the wafer because it's not, it's a naughty thing to do. And Luther D. Reed was in the same congregation and didn't criticize at all, but it was Borneman who was offended. What do you remember about Luther Reed? He was such an institution here for so long. I mean, director of the library about 60 years. I mean, yeah, I don't remember much about Luther. He was, he was a name and a figure on campus. I remember mostly sitting fairly, in chapel, fairly, uh, sitting fairly close to the front, and whenever somebody did something he didn't like, he'd uh, <laughs> non-verbally say some, something, but aside from that I didn't. The students were pretty much, if not exclusively, male. And I ran a small small discussion group composed of selected males, um, and they, uh, one of them offended somebody else. I forget how that exactly went. But uh, they made a comment about this guy, and it really uh, hit the guy the wrong way and devastated him. And I tried to get the group of males to go and apologize and ask for forgiveness. They wouldn't have a word that, that was, that wasn't macho. And several years later, when women started coming, the atmosphere changed. Women could be sensitive enough to hurt feelings or devastation and would freely uh, make, it, make, uh, make it up. So the males were males at that <coughs> time, and it took a while for the female warmness to show through, but it changed the campus. And these weren't just warm, fuzzy females. They were highly intellectual, intellectually gifted. So then the campus became more introduced to a, a total response. Evelyn yeah. Holroyd was the first student, mm -hmm. I think. Evelyn Holroyd. Um, she was known as, as Sister Cupcake. I think she was a member of the diaconate. Uh, and I think there were jokes about her presence in, uh, in Heineken's class, yeah, you know, and how yeah. he had to oh, yeah. change his language a bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can imagine really? that might have caused an adjustment. Yeah. Um, um, Sister Cupcake, you said? Yes, they used to call her. I think she, w she loved to bake. I think okay. that's where that stemmed from. Then she later retired at Luther Village at... at uh, Lidditz. Mm -hmm. Martha, do you remember at all generally the year in which she became the first woman student? No, 70 sometimes. So, was but. it? Yeah. See, I don't remember that name. She was probably off campus by the time mm -hmm. I came in 67. But in terms of women students, the one, not to minimize the ones who were here before, but Mar Marie Yergi sticks it out in my mind as somebody I dealt with who was very bright, uh, who was very human. Mm -hmm. Became bishop. And became a bishop. And has done a marvelous job, I would guess. Mm -hmm. And to this day, Ruth and I are very close to any number of them. It always puzzled me a bit, but not really, that I became closer to those students that I counseled as pastoral care person, rather than to those who were in the classroom. Now, I had good relations with some of those, 
but the ones that we have continually and do continually hear from are the ones that, like Jim Yergi and Marie, are the ones that I also dealt with in terms of uh, conversation, personal conversation. I was heavily influenced by Carl Rogers at that time, who was a client-centered therapy, and the name indicates what Rogers had in mind. That is, you focus on, on, on the person, the counselee, or more technically put, you get inside the frame of reference of that person and begin to see the world from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think I really tried to get these males and young people to see the world from the other side. Can you and, say a little bit more about that? Well, uh, it, it, yeah. And not to come with prejudgments or pre-advice or all kinds of things, but simply in the process of showing that you could understand them, that they made sense to you, that they made sense to you, was a healing process for them. And some students got it, some students had an aptitude for that, and some students thought it was wimpy. You're supposed to have a position and direct them and tell them and all kinds of things. So that was one of the, and the second point uh, I tried to emphasize and live by and still do, there's a theological, diff uh, there's a theological dimension in pastoral care. So in the seminary several years ago, hired somebody who was non-Lutheran implying to me that Lutheran theology, theology was not that important. That sort of went against what I thought. Pastor care is heavily theological. It relies on somebody that comes from a certain theological position. Anyway, they wanted to do good in the world. Uh, and uh, that was their main thing. Even as pastor, they would often define themselves not as an ambassador of the Church or of Christ, but doing good, being nice to people. And most of the faculty, I think, tried to get them beyond that, without dismissing its importance, tried to get them beyond that, and mm -hmm. saying there are things to believe in uh, and to know about, rather than just being nice to people. Just like, instead of being a nice social worker, for example. The Rumans and the Aidens became very close friends when we were called here. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if you probably ask anybody at that time, they would associate the two names. And it lived out by the Rumans had a cottage in the lake and we'd often be invited up there. Uh, but the thing that I had remember uh, is uh, Jack and I were at a conference, before we even went to the seminary, I think I indicated, Jack and I were speakers at the conference uh, at Valparaiso, more specifically, and Jack was the keynote speaker in giving the biblical, it was on diac di uh, diacono ministry, and I gave you know, this psychological thing. Well, a couple people there didn't like that. They were critical of that. That wasn't theological enough, and that was, and they were rather nasty. And uh, after the session, Jack and I and a couple others were headed for lunch. Jack and I were walking together, and he was very pastoral. He said, don't let them get to you. Don't let them bother you. What you said was fine. And I remember my first memory of Jack Herman really was he could be very pastoral, very helpful and understanding. I, I think you also felt that he could, could at times be rather more critical. Yes. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And my daughter has the same experience, namely, he saw Jack 
Uh, sure. She saw Jack as very as a real father and as very personable, and one who would give time to his children when they needed it. But of course, Jack is known primarily for. I think he was par excellence a churchman, aside from being a bi biblical scholar. He loved the church and worked, was known in the church. For each of us, we had grown up very intimately in the church and were involved. Um, and then, um, well, his kindness, um, um, what else? His, his intellect, um, his ambition. Our children considered the campus their playground, and there were, um, were many girls particularly. There were about 12 girls on campus, <clears throat> children of professors mainly, and two boys. So our daughters had a lot of playmates. Um, and then the faculty get-togethers. Um, We'd sometimes meet on special occasions for birthdays, mm -hmm. or have picnics in each other's yard. Um, the the faculty, looking back, the faculty wives organization. <laughs> yes. yes. It was very regimented. Um, we had the faculty wives met every month. <clears throat> Someone took look, took minutes, which which should be in the archives somewhere. I guess they are, and. Um, we we sponsored three different social occasions throughout the year: a social for the juniors when they arrived, mid mid year, a, a I don't know if it was a potluck, but something in a faculty home for the middlers, and at graduation time, a tea, I think it was a tea for the graduating seniors. Um, and there so, certainly there was a lot of intermingling. Um, we do things together, faculty wives, mm -hmm. some of the wives, our friends on campus would do things together. Um, when, I, when I first married Jack, I was really concerned about too much inclusiveness, you know, to be on a campus yeah. where your, <laughs> your husbands yeah. work together, yep. w live together. Um, and so, the, and there were problems that arose from that. There were some strains and tensions at times, but but it didn't turn out to be the kind of uh, negative that I I thought it would be. And you remember the tents for Auxiliary Day once a year in May. It was Auxiliary Day, and a huge tent would be erected back here, and we'd have 700, 800 women come. Um, so there was it was a well. They raised the money for. The Kaufman House, uh, where the Kaufmans lived, a uh, lot of renovations in the dorm, uh, and other things. On occasion, at least once or twice, instead of having the auxiliary day occur here on campus, we went down to the Bellevue Stratford Hotel in the ballroom and had had uh, our banquet there. Uh, I remember, I think during the Vietnam era, I remember a gathering of students and faculty in front of the library. Mm a kind of uh, watch or solidarity kind of gathering. It wasn't a protest, it was a supportive... Well, it, no, it was a protest too. Of course, we were next to, for quite a few years, next to Main Dorm, the two buildings that have been raised um, for Wiedemann Center. Um, and there were students who lived right immediately next to us. And our children would ride the, their tricycles up and down the, the pavement there. And one day, I think one of the students put a parking, um, a parking violation ticket on, on our daughter's tricycle. <laughs> and so there was some, some interaction with, with students and the children. I have a memory of, <clears throat> I think for a, a short while, I'm not sure how long, Jack was acting president, an interim thing. And I think it was... It was a difficult time, yeah. and I remember when things were somewhat resolved, um, Harold Albert took Jack and me out to a restaurant to kind of ease, mm -hmm. in a kind of easing uh, activity, um, which, which was a very kind and mm -hmm. kind thing to do. When Jack taught Greek, 
um, the intensive course of Greek in January, I guess Jan well, some in the summertime too, um, we used to invite the students for, for a meal and had a picnic table out in the back. And so one time I remember they all came in togas, which were their sheets. Mm -hmm. They took a sheet and draped it as a toga with wreaths on their heads. Oh, really? and, uh, but I think in that situation, I think he was a very patient. And I, oh, I've had testimonies from many students who said that um, they never felt put down. or uh, So in that situation, he was, was very patient. Including the teaching of Greek. Oh. He, he was mm. very helpful because he was patient. But... Well, he, and he loved teaching. I mean, he just loved teaching. So, so that was his forte. He could p summarize that whole thing, but with 20 footnotes if he had to. He was known in both of his books, but, uh, but in his teaching, mm -hmm. that he had so many sources that could appear as footnotes. Well, we also owned for a while <laughs> a farm in t oh, yeah. together. We had a farm. Go say something about that. In the lower Poconos. And then uh, eventually, well, we'd work together on it. The Roy was the headmaster. Oh. Uh, you know, he knew the techniques to use. And I could drive the tractor. Yeah. So and could Mo, both drove so the tractor. Could Martha. Yeah. And so could Martha. On we both the hill. did. On the hill. Oh. And it was they, a farm. They owned a, a home. They owned the parcel that had, had a house on it. And we owned part of the land, though. Yeah. Wasn't oh, that? yeah. Uh, then eventually, we, we sold out. You, how, we sold out to you. You to sold us. out to us. Yeah. How do you put it? <laughs> they no. bought our portions. They bought their yeah, portions. Right. Yeah. So they had the yeah. whole the Partly whole thing. because our family was going to, our daughter, was going to move into the farmhouse. And it we became, would have become very awkward, I think, uh, in terms of conflict of interest. The whole, whole Lutheran Catholic dialogue is a whole other thing. Because in, in more recent years, I went, oh, I always accompanied him. And so I got to know the participants, which was was a blessing. Yeah.